power that God has been to do to our heavenly form of faith. Right. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, you know, really glad to uh, see everyone uh, today. Welcome to our presentation on implicit bias uh, in the workplace. And I uh, really get excited to be uh, presenting today uh, alongside uh, Priscilla, uh, who's uh, the director, I'll let her, you know, introduce herself and start us off. But, um, you know, so she works with the uh, lead. So that I work for um, under lead here. So I'm really looking forward to having this discussion today. And I'll give it to uh, Priscilla to, to start us off. So next slide. So again, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, we welcome questions, so feel free to ask questions during our presentation. Um, and we will also have time at the end for any questions that come up. So you can unmute yourself, raise your hand or type it in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat uh, re and please rename yourself and add your prefer uh, your pronouns to your name so that will help me out when addressing people. For access, we have an ASL interpreter and live captioning being typed. This presentation is being recorded and streamed live on Facebook. We will also upload our presentation to our YouTube channel. Um, presenters will be doing visual descriptions of images. If we miss one, please let us know. And we will also be sending the slides and the link to the recording to everyone that registered. So at MDRC, our mission is uh, MDRC cultivates disability pride and strengthens the disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. And on the right side is our Michigan Disability Rights Coalition logo with the green background. So the two programs that are putting this on um, that are a part of MDRC is the Leadership Engagement and Advocacy Development, so LEAD. Um, we provide BIPOC parents of children with IDD and adults with IDD with the information, tools, and skills that they need to develop leadership advocacy skills to be an advocate for themselves and their children. The other program is Lead In, which is the Leadership Engagement and Advocacy Development Inclusive Network, and that is a program that creates a community of practice supporting organizations that primarily serve BIPOC communities to reach their inclusive inclusion goals for people with developmental disabilities. And both of these programs are funded by the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council. So uh, my name is again, Tamika uh, Sitches Spruce. I am the lead air director. Uh, my pronouns is she, her and hers. Uh, my physical description is I am a, a brown skinned uh, African American woman. Um, I have my hair in the ponytail and I wear like a black uh, tank top. And um, our other team member, uh, Felice Turner, who uh, unfortunately was not able to 
joined us today, but uh, she also, she works with lead and then her pronouns is she, her, and hers. And she's also uh, in the picture here, uh, a brown skinned woman. She's wearing red uh, glasses and a black uh, hat. And then, go ahead, Priscilla. And I, um, again, I am Priscilla Cano. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I am the bilingual disability advocate for the LEAD program as well as LEAD IN. Um, I am a Mexican-American woman with brown hair. Uh, it's about short, shoulder, shoulder length and I wear black um, rimmed glasses and I'm wearing a black t-shirt. So we'll start off about with what is implicit bias. Impl implicit bias is the process of associating stereotypes or attitudes towards categories of people without conscious awareness. Um, it's derived from subconscious feelings, attitudes, and prejudice we develop due to prior influences and imprints throughout our lives. So these are all the things that we associate with others that we have learned subliminally through um, other things in our lives. Because impl implicit bias, because it is subconscious, implicit bias can sometimes cause us to react in ways that are at odds with our core values and beliefs. Though these biases may be unintentional, they still can have an overpowering effect on our judgments and how we treat others. So although we can sometimes be aware of the implicit, the biases that we have, and um, they don't define who you are with your core values and beliefs, um, we have to be very intentional being aware that they are there. So today we are going to talk about how to um, counteract some of those implicit biases that we have. And so, uh just spend a few uh, minutes about the process of how uh, implicit bias work. Uh, this was, um, uh, and this is a graph from the National Equity Project. And um, it's a picture of light blue and dark blue uh, arrowed circle. So, you know, it starts with, uh, you know, Crimey. Uh, so that's really where you know the information is received via images, messages, and experiences. So uh, again, like what Priscilla said, is what we uh, intake. So it could be through you know uh, uh, media, you know music, television. Uh, has a huge impact of creating uh, messages about different uh, groups of people, uh, family, um, as as well, and uh, and so it was just I was actually watching um, a a documentary yesterday uh, for Juneteenth. It was uh, uh, the Black Barbie. And it was a great documentary. So, you know, just went through the whole process of how, uh, you know, the history of, you know, Black Barbies from uh, the beginning, like around the 60s, you know, until now. And they were one of the key highlights without spoiling uh, the, the documentary. But essentially, a little bit, it was talking about how the pride and how, you know, uh, Black children and particularly Black girls are, you know, see how they see themselves, you know, especially as a relation to uh, the white Barbie. And you would think in 2024 that, you know, Black girls would, because of the increases of the different, uh, you know, Black Barbies, that they would have a different view of their placement in the world. But like I said, the documentary show that it's different. So um, that some things may have not changed. So that's just like, like it, it's all of us, you know, 
a black, white, Hispanic, all of us are primed, you know, consistently with those um, images. So then once we have those images, then if we begin to associate and assume, um, you know, it, it, it develops into those negative stereotypes of, you know, who's good, who's bad, and, and those type of things. So um, it goes from that to decisions and actions. So decisions and actions that are at odds with one's intentional explicit values, which are driven by a conscious association and associations and assumptions. So basically, you know, you can say, well, like many people say, oh, I'm just, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. But, you know, if you grow up in America, you have, you know, uh, different views and you grow deprived to, you know, see people a certain way. And so you may think you don't see color, but in all actuality, you more than likely you do unconsciously. So uh, that's a little bit of the, the process that goes on. Um, so the identities, uh, you know, is impacted. You know, it's all different types of, you know, identities that's impacted. So of course, you know, you have race, but they also have gender. That's a, I think another, you know, a huge one um, that we still deal with you know, gender norms uh, of what men and women, those type of things uh, people are supposed to do. Uh, gender expression, you know, another one. Uh, class, uh, you know, how people in poverty uh, supposedly supposed to act or what comes with being, you know, um, living in poverty. Um, the sexuality, disability, of course, is um, another one. Cult country of origin, uh, you know, we Americans, we have a very westernized view of, you know, other countries and make um, horrible assumptions <laughs> about, you know, other countries and other groups of people. Um, and so, uh, that's where bias, religion, you know, um, Islamophobia, um, it, you know, um, those type of things as well. Um, age, you know, you have ages of uh, body size. There's, you know, discrimination and bias when it comes to that. Uh, language, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, misconceptions. Uh, you know, as far as with language and who actually, you know, uh, from what region speaks what. I think there's some, you know, ignorance and bias towards that. Uh, dialect, uh, the, you know, the, the different parts of the country, you know, everywhere has different types of uh, dialects. So uh, that's not often acknowledged and respected. Uh, and then sent uh, clothing. People can make judgments uh, based on you know, the clothes that is being worn. Uh, and then you could be who we hire for a job or, you know, that reflects on who we select for promotion, which treatments options uh, we make available to patients. And so we all make, you know, judgments, all these various things. Uh, so implicit by acts committed against another person are called microaggressions. So, you know, the things that you may say, uh, you know, I know sometimes, you know, as people with disabilities, people make exceptions, have bias, say, oh, you can't, you know, do this, and, but it's not really that you can't, or they make make comments like, oh, I'm so, so, you know, that's wonderful that you, you know, have a, a college degree, or, you know, that's some of the things that I had to um, encounter or, you know, just different comments that people uh, make uh, that, you know, unfortunately we have to 
experience in life and in the workplace. So, uh, so when you know goes into again implicit bias, of course, can happen towards uh, people with displays, like I mentioned before. Uh, you know, so these are assumptions are made on person's ability, potential, productivity based on disability they have, um, and so those living at the intersections of disability, race, or other forms of identities. Um, can often also experience discrimination and uh, the implicit bias can be a higher, higher rate, you know, than the others. So uh, if you want to, you know, put it in the chat, uh, what are some uh, uh, implicit bias or microaggressions that you have received? Uh, you feel comfortable? Uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, but they also want to know that those uh, people, even people with disabilities, uh, can also have implicit bias. So, because we receive those messages uh, growing up as well. And so, uh, we most definitely also can be. Uh, have microaggression towards others um, as well. Okay, in the chat, Jessica wrote, um, in quotation, I forgot you have a disability. So that's something that they've heard. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it comes, you know, from people with this, like vis vis visible disabilities and not visible disabilities. Um, as well, you know, microaggressions that occur. So yes, thank you, Jessica, for sharing your story. Uh, here is a video that is uh, done by PBS uh, that talks about why it's so awkward when it comes to, you know, dealing with race or other things and you know, as it relates to implicit bias. If I ask you to please not think about a white bear, don't think about it, don't think about it, don't think about it, don't think about it, you probably won't be able to stop thinking about it, don't think about it, don't think about it, white bear. There's significant research on this, and some researchers are asking if there's times when trying not to think about race might make one appear racist. Here's the thing to try. Okay, do me a favor, um, just act super normal. Like actually normal though. 99% of the time, this ends up awkward. So what happens with this instruction? When you're around people of a different race, try really hard to be really, really normal and treat people really, really equally. I talked to the Perception Institute's Rachel Godzel, who highlighted a study on a common phenomenon in social situations where a white person might overcompensate. What are the goals that people generally have when going into an interaction? Most of us who are white presume that we're going to be respected for the most part. So that's not really a goal because we just think it's there. So we come into the interaction like looking for signs that we're liked and we're informal and we're, you know, perhaps goofy and looking for the sign that we're likable. But oftentimes for African Americans and Latinos, the presumption of respect isn't there because of experiences that many have had not being treated respectfully. The desire to ensure that they are respected is first and foremost on their minds. So you've got one party that's not really even thinking about respect and another party that's like hyper aware of it. And if the person of color is looking for signs that we respect them and we come in with this informal looking to be liked dynamic, that can really backfire because I don't seem like I'm being particularly respectful. So you get this spiraling miscommunication. I then perceive that person not to like me and to be unfriendly. And both of us again leave feeling as though our fears have been confirmed. To be clear, we're not talking here about interactions that involve explicit racism. In this scenario, neither party has any ill intent, but the end result is the exact opposite of what both were hoping for. There's too much thinking about that white bear. 
One bright light here, there's evidence that knowing about racial anxiety can be enough to make people feel less anxious. It kind of gives them permission to feel a little weird, and that keeps them from acting too weird. So thinking about race might make things awkward, but knowing that it might make things awkward can make things less awkward. Next time, how slowing down and being more deliberate might make it easier. And so that is. We have a comment in the chat. Aaron mm -hmm. wrote, the way in which individuals at work discuss patient with disabilities or speak from a completely medical model position. Yeah, yeah, that is another a great example of, you know, a placid bias, seeing disabled people as just people that need to be fixed and uh, cured. Um, yeah, most definitely it's like, just, you know, no, we, you know, we want to be, need to be healthy, you know, and healthy doesn't automatically equal out to, it does equal to be, you know, fixed or cured. So yes, thank you for that. And so yeah, with the video, uh, I think that's, that's a great example of, you know, sometimes you even thinking of instances where people might overly compensate or try to, you know, uh, I can see how, you know, it can make it weird when you try to overly do it. Like, I'm not racist and try to, you know, sometimes people might make a, uh, uh, make themselves look silly trying to, you know, prove that they're not, you know, with around, you know, different groups of, of people. So I think that video definitely, uh, you know, is good that it shows that it's, it's okay to, uh, you know, have, you know, be recognized that the anxiety and might be look different or awkward, but, you know, just, you know, treat people with respect and, um, you know, and then make it less, less awkward. Like I give it to Priscilla. Implicit bias and bias practices and strategies. So um, we're going to discuss some practices and strategies you can do on an individual level and a systematic level. For an individual level, so mindful reflection. So this is the process of examining um, assumptions, prejudices, biases, and anything that you would consider that would affect the way you interact or your expectations of people. Um, in this process, you objectively describe the behavior without interpretation or evaluation and like consider where maybe that person was coming from. Um, by doing this, you it can lead to more culturally and linguistically responsive approaches to handling things with people by examining your own prejudices internally. You, you can navigate that. Um, identifying your triggers. So working across cultural differences can activate triggers of perceived threats that are based on our cultural frame of reference. So um, sometimes when someone says something about how you're coming across, it, it can make you defensive. So identifying the type of things that would might trigger you to become defensive based on your biases and your um, prejudices can help you navigate getting better at acknowledging them and, and fixing that. Um, also addressing microaggressions. So um, not letting them, first I wanna talk about what microaggressions are. So those are everyday verbal and nonverbal and environmental slights, snubs or insults that are could be intentional or unintentional and that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely on their marginalized group membership. Um, the first step in addressing microaggression is to recognize when it has happened and the message that it is sending. The next step is to have an approach to um, 
to talk to that person about the aggression and how it how that their comment or whatever they did impacts not just the person that it was geared towards but the environment as a whole and then soda strategy so soda strategy is um to stop and um pause and reflect on what your habits are and what your interactions and when you enter an interaction that feels challenging so work hard on staying open-minded so that one would be to stop the second would be to observe so check yourself um don't react to what's going on instead take a breath use the 10 second rule when your brain gets triggered it's it um it takes stress hormones approximately 10 seconds to move from the body to the prefrontal cortex. So you want to give your, your brain and your body time to um, catch up before you say something. So take your time to breathe and observe what's going on and how you're going to handle that. Detach is the D. Sometimes when we get triggered, we are personally invested in being right or exercising our power over others. Um, deliberately shifting your consciousness to other pleasant or inspirational images. So try to um, take a drink of water, take a few steps back, shake yourself up a bit. So detaching yourself for, from the situation for a minute to give yourself the ability to, to think clearly and not act on your emotions of feeling like you're being um, you know, called out or triggered based on a, a bias that that you that might not align with your um, values. And awaken is the last one. So that's the A. And um, with that one is shifting your focus from yourself to the other people in front of you. So it helps you wake up or become present in the moment. And then you would be more likely to accept the feedback that you are getting and change these things. So trying to see the other person as someone with their own feelings and um, what they are thinking, how they are feeling in that moment. So shifting over to their perspective will get you out of your reactive mode and be able to make it a positive interaction where both parties can learn. Yes, and on the systematic level, uh, so what can we do as a community, you know, through systems um, is to be mindful of uh, decision making. So that is, uh, you know, being, being like not being reactive, but proactive uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, decision making. So, you know, looking at policy, uh, looking at ways to, you know, reduce uh, the the disparities uh, that may that will you know occur when it comes to making certain decisions. Um, so, like, I'll get to a little bit more later when it comes to uh, the workplaces, the workplace. But uh, you know, just when you in a position of power. Okay, so like, how is this decision going to impact? How can we, again, be more proactive and, you know, to reduce the harmful, you know, actions or the harmful uh, things that occur in the disparities uh, that exist? So, uh, like I said, I'll talk about more about that when it comes to the workplace up in a minute and how that can happen. Uh, then you have create human connections. And so that is important too. Uh, I know in Michigan, uh, where we at, we are very much still uh, a very segregated state and uh, where you see a lot of uh, communities. Where I'm from, you know, in the Detroit area, uh, it, it is still, you know, segregated racially um, as well. And so even though a little bit of the 
uh, demograph demographics have changed, but not much. So, you know, when you be around other cultures and other, you know, people outside of yourself, uh, you know, you you will begin to challenge those misconceptions uh, and those biases that you, uh, you know, may, may have. So, you know, creating that human connections with people who are different from you um, is very important. Um, and then diversify your book collection. And so uh, that's nothing too. So read different books through different, you know, authors uh, that's, you know, different from your own um, experience. Um, I think it's important and, and it cultivate a brave community. And so uh, just having a community that around you that will challenge, you know, you and, uh, you know, choosing not to, uh, you know, hold on to those biases uh, belief because, you know, when you're, you're um, sometimes with your family, you know, all think a certain way or, you know, the community that you belong to all think of a certain way, you know, that it's sometimes hard for people to, you know, uh, break away from that. And, and, and sometimes, you know, there might be pushback from the community. So, you know, just surrounding yourself around people, like I said, who's different from you, um, you know, from where you grew up and those type of things is, is important. And then not just be performative, because I think sometimes people, uh, you know, try to have connections to other groups because it's like sometimes performative to make themselves feel good. Or, you know, somebody, for example, might say uh, something racist. And they say, well, I got a black friend, you know, like that's supposed to prove something that they're not, you know, racist. So I, I really think it's important to, you know, uh, create genuine and real human connection uh, with people and not be uh, performative um, in relationships and, and things like that, um, I think is very, uh, very much um, important when it comes to challenging the implicit bias that, that you may have. Um, so there's an um, implicit bias test uh, that you can take. Um, if Priscilla, if you could put that link in the chat, but uh, this implicit bias test is, you know, really good because it shows where you may have, uh, you know, implicit bias uh, towards others. So you just see where you, you know, may need to to grow. And I also want to uh, make note that uh, you can even have implicit bias within your own group that you belong to as well. And so uh, I think that's a very key uh, point to, to make, um, especially because we uh, also, you know, can take in and internalize the, uh, we call it FDRC, internalized ableism, you know? So because again, the messages, so we might have biases towards, you know, other groups of disabled people or that to say when it comes to race, you know, you can still be, you know, for example, black and have a negative viewpoint of other black people, which is not the same. Um, have shown, you know, and uh, so forth and so on. So I just want to make that note uh, as well. And that that um, test is by Harvard, and so I have posted the link in the chat. Thank you. Uh, so why should we deal with uh, implicit bias in the workplace? And it's because, which I think is 
very much forgiven. Uh, but implicit bias can take tremendous, a tremendous toll on you know workplace uh, product productivity. Uh, it may cost the company significant money, time, and reputation. Uh, you know, if you do not adjust them appropriately, it can really create uh, a very hostile uh, environment in the workplace. Uh, so it's some ways, more ways, uh, concrete ways that it can affect the workplaces, implicit bias in hiring uh, restricts the best talent. So, you know, when you see somebody, uh, you know, and then look at their name, for example, um, and based on a name, you know, you're like, well, uh, you know, I will pass them up because you have an image in your head or you might even know why you just pass them up. Uh, that restricts a lot of good talent. Uh, it creates a homogeneous workplace, a culture that can be significant to detriment to creative thinking. Everybody, you know, look the same and everybody from the same economic background, uh, you know, the same culture background. And that's not going to, you know, it's going to be limited um, as far as what, can be done and the markets that can be reached. Um, the injustice of marginalized workers may lead to harassment or other kinds of workplace prejudice. So uh, I don't know how many times, you know, you may have seen in different, um, you know, workplaces that, you know, marginalized workers can try to go to HR and nobody's doing anything about it. And then a lawsuit, you know, occurs uh, because of the prejudice that they uh, received. Um, employees also feel unsafe or alienated due to implicit prejudice um, in the workplace. Uh, it can lead to high employee turnover, you know, rate. A negative look to the brand reputation how many times you may have think about uh, you saw an advertisement or you know a movie came out and it's like oh, that's not 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 a good look you know and uh, and it you know reinforces stereotypes and you know that affects the brand and so the brand has to do this whole thing to try to you know change its image and things like that. So uh, implicit bias. And, uh, workers who feel unsafe at work and further feel less engaged in the work. You know, how many of you can think of a time where, you know, you receive those microaggressions and you're like, well, you know, I'm not going to really put my 100% into this work because I'm not safe and uh, receiving prejudice and and then ultimately end up leaving. And so um, it's something that really needs to be done and needs to be uh, dealt with, especially in this uh, climate. So to reduce uh, the implicit bias within the workplace is have awareness of others and biases. So it goes back to you know, recognizing that, you know, you will have biases, but then how can you move uh, beyond it? You know, how can you, uh, you know, which goes down to, another example is slow down your decision-making process. Uh, you know, and then taking the implicit bias test to see where you need to, to grow. Um, and uh, they also fight implicit bias in the processes and strategies. And so uh, to to get uh, what I tell the nonprofit leaders that I work with is, you know, when it comes to hiring people with disabilities, go to, you know, uh, 
colleges and you know go to the the, the department uh, that deals with students with disabilities. You know, go to the CILs. Go to uh, which, which is the Centers for Independent Living. You know, go to where disabled people you know are at and uh, you know and, and, and send them the uh, the uh, not the resume the you know the job description and job posting and things like that. Because a lot of times employers just go to the same source you know, every time that they, you know, need to uh, look for employees. So, you know, just thinking outside the box and go to uh, the community. So just, you know, having those processes and strategies and reassess the policies uh, that currently exist uh, to be proactive instead of reactive is very important. Uh, make sure the recruitment panels are diverse. And so, you know, when it comes to the hiring and recruitment and those type of things, have a person with disability, you know, on the panel as, as I told you, the nonprofit leaders, or have, you know, have American or somebody from the LGBTQ community, or, you know, so just have a very, you know, you have different uh, viewpoints when it comes to whether somebody is a candidate or not. Uh, increased interaction among employees. So a lot of companies have DEI, uh, you know, committees, uh, which hopefully will not go, go away, uh, but DEI company, uh, uh, committees or you know, uh, at disability uh, employee uh, resource groups and, you know, different things like that. So, uh, you know, that is important and, you know, have, you know, good uh, outings, work outings or whatever the case may be to increase the interaction uh, and of people with, uh, you know, various employees incorporate better vocabulary. Uh, as we know in the disability community, there's a lot of vocabulary that is outdated. And so, uh, but that comes along with the other um, communities, you know, there's whole sets of words that we don't say anymore or sets of words that is kind of being said. So incorporate um, better uh, better vocabulary and again slow down your decision making process uh, which is uh, very important here is another video about checking biases Can you make it full screen, Tamika? Yeah. And closed caption, maybe. Let's look at how to measure bias in ourselves and in others. Here's Dolly Chu from NYU. We sent emails to real professors in real universities. They contacted over 6,500 professors. Awesome. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's fine, I think. Yeah, I don't. We can just push play then. Yeah. At random, from 260 American universities. We sent them an email that looked like it came from a real person asking for a meeting to learn more about the PhD program in that university. But we randomly assigned whether the the fictional person sending that email had a name that sounded male or female and sounded white, Chinese, Hispanic, Indian, or black. What we found that is if you were a white male, you were far more likely to receive a response back 
than if you were in all those other categories put together as a group. Some of this could be explicit racism, but it's far more likely that in many cases, these professors are just busy. They can't respond to every email they get. So they kind of let their subconscious decide for them. And that's where their biases come through. Research shows that our racial biases are often more about who we choose to help than who we don't. And we tend to help people who are similar to us. But you aren't 6,500 randomly selected professors. So how can you figure out where you might be making similar unconscious choices? First, there's a well-known test online you can take that can help show you biases you hold. Or just do an audit. Whatever data you have, whether it's formal data in a computer or whether it's just data that's sort of anecdotal, look at the data. For example, I met this fantastic executive in Silicon Valley. He takes great pride in being someone who actively tries to achieve gender balance on his teams, knowing that Silicon Valley and tech are skewed heavily male. So he looked at his professional social network, his Twitter, his LinkedIn. He found his network was far more skewed male than he expected. So there is a place where he could actively work to shift that, and that's what he's been doing since then. So this is not a scientifically exact self-audit, but it can still be useful, and you can audit anything. So maybe start by taking that online test for bias, maybe check out whose emails you're replying to, but you can also audit yourself for implicit bias by asking a friend to observe you in the real world. If you're a teacher, have people look at who you call on most in class, whatever your interactions are. One practical thing that people should do is take stock of their friends. It would be very useful for people to actually make lists of people with whom they spend time. Look for patterns. That's the audit. That's the assessment we can all do. Next time, some people say you should go out and make as many friends of different races as possible. All right. Yeah, so that's... Uh... important to do to, like they said, to do uh, an audit, you know, um, just being conscious of the biases uh, that, that that you may have. So, um, so, yes. Before I get to the evaluation, um, so kind of also part of that doing a, you know a self audit. Um, I know some of these these things that come up when you when you take the implicit bias training or when you get your res or not the test and you get your results. Um, it can be triggering, like we said in the other um, slide. So sometimes even doing it just yourself, like thinking of a, uh, for example, what the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a white male or uh, a black male or a person with a disability or any type of thing, just thinking to yourself and reflecting upon yourself, like the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of these categories of things or people, and that, that can start that process for you. Um, it doesn't have to be, we, it doesn't have to be immediate change. It, it, it's a very gradual process to try to break down all those biases and to hopefully not pass them down to our children, our families, or, you know, we want to change that within ourselves and then within our space and our, and our people. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things is that when we do, when we attend implicit bias trainings or we do implicit bias trainings, sometimes people get um, defensive where, they feel like they're being told, this is something you need to change right away. This is something you need to fix right away. And um, it can be discouraging and it can be hard to want to start that change because it seems like it's this big thing that needs to be done, but it can be done in small steps. The goal is to change um, as much as you can. Um, with that yeah. being said. Yeah, and that too just made me think of you know, what you were saying uh Priscilla that you know it can be triggered and it can make people uh feel guilty and, you know like oh you know that's that's why not the pushback too because it's like that means I'm a bad person you know like it's it, it stuff so and people don't want to of course don't want to 
not be made to feel like, you know, they are a bad person. Uh, but I say, you know, when I do these trade or presentations, I say we all drunk the Kool-Aid. That's kind of like, you know, my saying, you know, we all drunk the Kool-Aid, but, uh, you know, but we can, you know, work towards having a more uh, inclusive society, you know, once we're conscious of our bias and then move beyond that by again policies and creating, you know, the world uh, that we want to see. Yep. And there's a lot of places that um, put on these types of, of trainings and presentations. I know uh, one that I've attended and was really helpful for me was through the National Equity Project. Um, that's a really good one. Um, and it's just about trying to be a, a better person and hope that you you can try to change these things. I am, um, so if you could please fill out our evaluation form, I will be dropping the link in the chat. It's a short um, serve, uh, Google form, and that really helps us um, know what we are doing, if it's working and what things we can change and how you liked or disliked or any comments, concerns, questions can be put on there. Um, if you want to learn more about our programs, you can do so by contacting the lead in program at, can you go back one? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> at um, info at my, my so mymdrc.org or the lead program at lead at mymymdrc.org. If you want to contact the presenters, um, Tamika's email is Tamika, T-A-M-E-K-A -E at mymdrc.org. Um, Felice, who was not able to attend, but her email is also on the screen. And uh, mine, Priscilla, P-R-I-S-C-I-L-L-A at mymdrc.org. Um, stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash mymdrc or our YouTube channel where we do upload these videos. Um, uh, the, our event, Bright also has any events that we, any public trainings that we put on. We have one coming up on Monday for our part in the um, World Refugee Awareness Week happening. So it is about disabilities in the refugee community. So if that's something that interests you, you can check our um, page on Eventbrite and it should be on there if you want to sign up. Yes, yes. And then on July 3rd, I want to say, we have the crowd act as well that that's that that's going to be coming up on Eventbrite but we have another one that's going to be uh talking about the crowd act when it comes to uh black women's hair and you know hair discrimination um and has released to also uh people with disabilities so that's another presentation so look out for that as well on um Eventbrite so uh are there any questions that you all have or comments or about implicit bias? You can put those in the chat or unmute yourself, whichever is easiest. Anything uh, kind of struck a chord? Uh, Jessica put in the chat, thank you so much for providing this event. You're welcome, Jessica. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, Sally said, I'm looking forward to taking the test. Thanks for the thought provoking session. Thank you, Sally. Thank you.
Again, if you could take the time to fill out our survey, our evaluation survey, we would really appreciate it. The link is in the chat. You can put it in there one more time. All right. So there's no further uh, questions uh, or, or comments. We definitely uh, thank you for uh, coming out today uh, for our presentation. And uh, we hope that you have a great rest of, of your afternoon. And uh, please check out our next event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Katie, for providing accommodations, captioning, and um, interpretation. Yes, thank you. Thank you.